where we discuss the hottest fire news to hit within the last two weeks. I'm your host, Inanna Hankey, and I'm joined today by the panel, Chief Bob Horton and Chief Jeff Buchanan. And we are lucky to have organizational psychologist, Dr. Andrew Halter, back with us for this episode. Our topic today is CBD usage in the fire service. The White River Township Fire Department in Indiana has stirred up some controversy after changing their drug policy and allowing its firefighters to use CBD products. CBD has been legal in Indiana since March of 2018. The policy change for this fire department includes CBD and Delta 8 products in any form. The chief of the Township Fire Department acknowledged that they know firefighters have problems sleeping and there's an emotional and physical toll that takes place with firefighters' bodies and CBD is something that can help. Jeff, tell me about the drug policies that you've seen during your time in the fire service. Well, first, I need to give a shout out to Chief Jeremy Pell for the boldness in his decision making. You know, I'm not here to debate right or wrong, and we're going to have a great, rich discussion about this. But the move was bold. It was big and bold. And he set himself up for a heck of a lot of controversy uh, from every which way but he did what we're all, or at least what I'm going to say. So you think he made, he made a good decision and you think he did it on the best interest of, of his firefighters. So I really, really want to commend him for that. Uh, the drug policies that I've been mostly a part of absolutely don't include CBD. It is zero tolerance all the way around the board, any type of foreign substance, um, other than alcohol. And obviously there's only certain levels of alcohol that can be uh, found in the system. So, uh, so here in, in Nevada, at least in Southern Nevada, uh, it hasn't taken shape to include CBD, um, at least that I'm, that I'm aware of yet uh, in any of the departments that I'm familiar with. And, and Bob and Andrew may have different takes on that depending on you know, parts of the country they're from. But um, I can tell you the conversation did come up. There's, there's no doubt about that. There were uh, several conversations. Southern Nevada, it's only, or in Nevada, I should say, it's only re- fairly recently in the last couple of years become recreationally legal. I think that you're seeing that domino topple across the United States. I think it's something every state's going to have to deal with. The, the money is, and, and there's a lot of other reasons too. There's a lot of sheriffs that are behind decriminalizing uh, marijuana because of the waste of the resources for police officers. So there's a lot of other reasons besides the monetary piece that uh, regulating marijuana and that industry brings in. Um, so I think if you're not dealing with it, you are going to deal with it. I think the federal government puts a big limitation in this because they're on separate pages than the states that are that are legalizing it. But back down to the policy level locally, I think that, you know, from, from my standpoint, I'm, I'm, I'm open-minded to the discussion. I do think we have to, as administrators, as organizations and communities, we have to get more and more innovative in regards to how our public safety personnel are dealing with post-traumatic stress and overall reducing the amount of anxieties that they're they're building throughout their careers within reason. And I think through data, which again, this article focused a lot on the data on how this modality of treatment can be very, very helpful for uh, our certain challenges with one psychological health, specifically post-traumatic stress disorder injury. So I, I think that public safety leaders are gonna have to take on that conversation I think that eventually, I think you're going to see this across the country where there is going to be wide range adoption. I think it's going to be very similar to to facing alcohol decades and decades previously. Once the each state starts to opt in, there's more and more regulation. There's more and more data. I just think it's something that they're going to have to deal with. But uh, it's definitely coming to a theater near you if you're not already having a conversation and. I think you have to be at least open-minded to carry on the discussion. I don't know what the right or the wrong answer is, but 
I definitely know that firefighters are hurting. They need new and creative ways to to deal with their challenges while still maintaining their effectiveness as first responders, not jeopardizing their safety, the safety of others in the community. And uh, this could be that this could be that way. That makes perfect sense. And it seemed to me, or at least my impression of the pushback against this policy is that it will open the door for first responders to potentially be compromised while on the job from other more harmful substances. And I guess I'm curious, either Andrew or Bob, what substance do you think poses the biggest threat to fire service members' health? Like, is there something obvious or is this more of a nuanced issue? I don't know enough about all of all of this to really, really get into a deep dive. But I don't think we all know really enough about the effects of of CBD. I'll, I'll say specifically to CBD. And, and I get it. Like, I get the trade off and the article references you know, I take firefighter who told the fire chief, you know, I'd go home, take CBD oil. I don't feel compelled to drink beer, you know, using alcohol as some kind of a coping mechanism, which I, I don't want to dismiss as a problem. This is like, we have a major problem with, with mental health and, and wellness of people in general, and particularly in the workforce and firefighters. So I don't want to dismiss this. There's a lot of other paths forward besides it's CBD or it's drinking alcohol. But what we don't know and what, what my concern is, I think this is a risky policy. I understand why the chief took a step forward and, and felt there was a problem. So like, I think I understand that. And there looks like, you know, he tried to cover his decision making uh, references, research that was done with in partnership with a sports medicine company. I don't know what that research is or what they researched or what it is. There, there isn't studies referenced. They, they talk about research in the article, but not really citing what these studies are. And my understanding of this issue is one, because it's not federally legalized, that there, the FDA will not approve some of the testing that needs to be done to understand the effects of CBD. The article references this, and this is, again, my understanding is that trace amounts of THC which is the the part of marijuana that will get you high, uh, can be found in CBD oil. So it is possible to take CBD and get high and, and, and end up having a traceable amount of THC. And that is where I'm concerned about where CBD is currently and the effect it could have on uh, firefighters at, at work. So if you're on on a day off in between, you you take some amounts of CBD, which is legalized in many states, including Indiana, where this article is from, including in Oregon, and you end up with uh, uh, some high, you know, a THC, a measurable amount of THC in your system, and you go back to work the next day thinking you don't and something bad happens. That's That's really concerning to me. And we don't understand enough about that, about how is it affecting folks. You know, those who are operating heavy machinery under under certain medical conditions like these are these are things that we already have prescribed medications that are legalized where we have to be mindful of firefighters who are who are under even if it's under doctor's orders and in this case i can't remember if it was being medically prescribed or recreationally prescribed i'm not sure it matters because in many states it is legalized for both i'm concerned that we don't we don't know enough about uh, the effect of CBD on in long term, how long it lasts in the system and how it's impairing decision making at work. Yet I understand the other side of the argument, which is there's this you know negative effect that we're having uh, with post-traumatic stress. And this is helping resolve that. And there is there is sufficient studies and uh, at least I'm convinced. And, and I think Jeff alluded to that in his his argument on this is that CBD is having a positive effect on these these mental health conditions, including post-traumatic stress. I'm just not there where I think this is a good policy. And and if I were if, if fire chiefs who are listening to this, who are because they are wrestling with it right now, this I mean, this conversation is going going on in fire uh, departments and cities and, and districts across the entire country. I'd be worried about the effect of your workers comp insurance and what what their take or position is on whether or not you approve CBD, it sounds like some due diligence was done. The, the legal team in this case uh, approved it, but I can't imagine that all of them, all of them would. Those are those are the risks and those are the concerns that I have with instituting policy that allows for for C, for employees to take CBD. Andrew, I'm curious what your take is on this issue in general from an org psych perspective. I think that using 
marijuana medically, recreationally, culturally speaking, is something that's a bit more accepted these days, not everywhere, but certainly in some states and cities, it's not viewed as like drug culture per se. But what are your thoughts about the way that fire service operates? It's sort of paramilitary background. How does that interact with like allowing more of these alternative types of medical treatments to be used with firefighters? Give us your take. Yeah, I, everybody's really kind of encircled the wagons here on this thing, and I and it's huge, right? Like, there's just so much to consider with this. We, you know, we do face uh, some adverse conditions as first responders in this community, whether it's because of challenges with home life or things that we endure uh, at at work. And I know that a lot of us are trying to look for things. I don't know that this is necessarily the first place I would go looking for uh, relief out of some of the concerns that, that Bob raised. Delta-8 is somewhat notorious for also containing a bit of THC in it, which could cause someone to have a positive drug test. And I just don't know that we're there to be able to decide when it's okay and when it's not okay, what the time usages are and things like that. I think it's great to be bold and to make big decisions to try to reach out there and do something like that uh, for that particular chief. But um, yeah, I, I, one of the things I'm looking at here uh, was a, a study back in 2017 that found that 50% uh, of male firefighters had engaged in binge drinking within the last 30 days, 50%. I don't know that adding another option is necessarily the right option of something to take that we might see as a mind altering substance or, or whatever the case may be. And I know there is a lot of research out there that's supporting CBD. Um, the same even now with microdosing mushrooms is gonna be something that we as a country talk about and look at as an option for depression and anxiety. Uh, but I think that there's a lot of things that we can do as a fire service uh, to help our folks out that we're not even close to being at the end of that that arena yet before we would start looking for uh, medical interventions like this. I agree with you, Andrew and Bob, those points that you made. I, I'm really conflicted on this one. I, I got to tell you, there's not enough, there's not enough, there's not enough data on all these different things to to see where it would, could negatively impact. And I, I don't know what the answer is. I Again, just as I looked at this you know, from a policy perspective, the courage or the boldness to get out there, I thought was was definitely was noteworthy. Is it the right decision? I'm not, I'm just, I'm not sure. It'd be really interesting though, to compare and contrast because none of us were alive then in prohibition days as the alcohol discussion was coming on board. My guess is that these exact same discussions were being had, right? Between all of the above. And to the point that you made, Andrew, I feel really comfortable. Again, anecdotal, I get it. But I think we all know that respondents to surveys are not totally truthful. 50% seems low. 50% seems low to me. I bet you that bad boy is pretty gosh darn higher than that. And, uh, and so I think alcohol is a real problem. I think alcohol is a real problem. And here where I'm going to go here, and I know we infringe upon rights and all these other things, and it's dicey, and I'm not suggesting this. There are ways to put a stranglehold on alcohol. Not to say that we would, but you could put a breathalyzer at every door of every fire station. That ain't going to happen, right? Because there's an infringement on their rights. But there are ways, almost indisputable ways, to put a lock around certain things that that we're doing as a society or as a micro society for firefighters that could control things. Another example that gets in our way, not wearing air packs inside salvage and overhaul. Incident commanders see it all the time. You see it in your fire department. I saw it in my fire department. I have to pull the thumb and say, I didn't shut down operations and hey, everybody's got to put a, an air pack on in all these different situations. But my point is we have right now with the problems that we're facing better ways to control some of these runaway trains and we're not doing it right now. And uh, we're already challenging and, and I'm not doing a good job of making an argument for adding just one more with CBD. But I guess what I'm saying is that I'm just not sure that, I'm just not sure. Maybe that's where I land the plane here. I don't know what the right answer is. I'm. It hasn't been 
a part of my life, CBD, uh, you know, I'm not judging. It's just not something that's part of my life. That's something that I'm interested in necessarily. But I also don't rule out the fact that if it was in the future, something that someone shared with me, hey, Jeff, this is the right move for whatever the situation. Okay, maybe I try it. I don't know. I just think it's something that we're going to have to, uh, we have to wrestle with and we got to be, I think we have to be cautious. But I also think we got to remain really, really open-minded because, and to the points that you guys have both made, we just, we just don't know. I don't know what the answer is. Just to my, I think my bigger concern too is, is uh, the fact that we don't really have a testing method so like you said, we have these controls and my my fear would be if you're in a department that does post-incident drug screening, regardless of uh, reasonable suspicion or anything, what happens if I used Delta-8 or CBD, you know, 12, 24 hours before my shift? I'm fine now. I'm not under the influence of that uh, substance. However, I still may have a positive drug screen, you know, as a result of it. And so I... I think there's just a lot when you look at something like this that's got to go into that policy decision making. Kind of backing up Andrew on that, it's discussed in the article a little bit. You know, this the, the chief is recommending, as that anyone would, a quality CBD project, particularly one that is third party tested. But how do you know? You certainly you could recommend that, which I think is appropriate. Nana and I live here in Oregon. There's drugs being grown and, and oils extracted. And in my fire district, about every other warehouse was uh, extracting oils at a marijuana plants. So CBD, hemp, all these, these, these oil extractions are, are going on uh, left, right, and sideways here in Oregon. Very poorly regulated, very, you know, quality tested, not, you know, not approved. That's an issue. So, you know, as an organization that says we're going to allow CBD oil, we recommend you use a quality product. Not everybody knows what that is. And there's certainly no way the organization is going to know whether you're, you're accessing a quality CBD product. And, and the point part in part of quality is this amount of THC. That's it. I mean, that's my whole hang up on this whole discussion is there is there is even an allowable amount in a quality product of THC and how much CBD oil uh, somebody takes in that 12 to 24 hour period, say before a shift that Andrew was just talking about, allows for trace amounts of THC to be in your system. We may not think you're impaired, but you might be. We don't know. Uh, and. You know, this organization or many organizations have zero tolerance policies. What does that mean? You said I could take CBD. I took CBD. I'm fine. I test positive. I test test hot for THC. How are we going to look the other way? And that's not a zero tolerance policy. So I, I think there there is a lot. We don't know a lot. It's it, it's got to it's going to go through a lot more testing and a lot more litigation. Uh, someone always has to be first to to give it a try. So I I'm going to back you up, Jeff, on applauding the courage to say I, something has to be done to help my employees on this side of the argument on the issues that they seem to be having. That's the article's focus really highlights the fact that employees are struggling. And this seems to have been a, a, a effective policy. There's a quote in the article about something to that effect that uh, this is the best, best policy decision, you know, the chief has made. Uh, I'm still concerned and I don't recommend that that organizations run out and start to allow CBD without having uh, done their their due diligence in their particular state with their workers comp laws uh, and with their legal team understanding the effects of these uh, of the policy to endorse quality products that's a dangerous game right there so this parallel of alcohol you know if you're talking about distilled beverages or beers or wines higher quality is 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 better that just seems like a really dangerous game when you're talking about cbd is to be looking at higher quality products. And that seems almost uh, a bit counterintuitive that a public safety agency would be an endorser behind a CBD, you know, high quality CBD. So it's it's interesting. There's a, a whole heck of a lot more to be done. It's not going away though. I think that's where we all agree. This is not going away. It is growing every single year. And it, it just seems as though it's going to be at a point where where fire agencies are forced into it to some extent. And it's just going to be interesting to see how the whole thing unfolds. Definitely. For me, where this lands is back to the underlying issue that our firefighters are struggling with their mental health. They're struggling with sleep. They experience PTSD at a rate that is, you know, extremely above every other citizen or people who don't have first response jobs. And 
yes, it's important for us to be creative in the ways that we tackle these problems, but maybe there should be less of a focus on symptom treatment and more of the underlying cause that we're addressing. And this to me seems kind of in that it's like one of the Band-Aid options. Like, yes, you can treat a, an ability, you know, or a, a not being able to sleep with CBD, but maybe we should examine why they're having trouble sleeping in the first place too. Great. Well, before we hop off today, we do have a listener question that we want to answer. And that is, we have someone who is curious about how much a fire truck weighs. I don't know the answer to this, but one of you may. We got a group of people who I don't think uh, operate fire engines. We're not engineers who are on the on the particular call to answer that question. It's a really good, it's a really good question. And I go back, I, I actually never knew the answer to how much a fire truck weighed. And I was giving a station tour at some point, And that question came up from, you know, insightful young person walking around the, the fire engine. How much does this thing weigh? I'm looking at placards on the side. I'm, I'm, you know, trying to I'm inside the door, trying to get in. And I finally find it. I find it on there. And this particular fire engine weighed about 72,000 pounds. Now, of course, the weight of a fire engine changes. It depends on how, is it full of water or does it not have any water in it? Because a lot, some, some fire engine, it doesn't even have water at all. There are different types of fire engines, type ones, types two, type three, type six. So those are all of different sizes, but 72,000 pounds is this type one uh, fire engine that had, that I can't remember if that had water in it or not. Fire engines will carry anywhere. They could be anywhere from 250 gallons to 750 gallons in an, or, or a, a water tender or something truck that's somewhere in the. 2,500 gallons or 1,500. I mean, they're, they're all made with different size water tanks, which will affect the weight of a fire engine. And the, of course, the, the tools that are on it as well add weight. Hey, I just want to lump in there first. I, I would, Bob, your, your answer is super articulate. I'd say really, really heavy. That's where I would go with the weight. But I think what the, for the listeners, what, what might interest them is a gallon of water weighs eight pounds. So when you talk about 600 gallon tank, that's an extra 5K of weight and swishing around those fire engines that are moving, fire trucks that are moving, water tenders that are moving with that enormous amount of water and that enormous amount of weight are very tricky to drive. So tip your cap to those engineers that are that are getting those firefighters there safely. It is no easy feat to, to drive with that extra tonnage on uh, on your rig and with that variable and weight as it moving the, as it's moving around so it's uh, super heavy water's heavy and uh, they're tough to drive and think about it's you know it's sloshing around if it's not a full tank and water's sloshing around and it's pulling the, the the apparatus in one way or the other i don't know andrew what do you have uh yeah <laughs> uh we, i've I've been on them anywhere, I think, from 30 some thousand pounds to close to 80,000 pounds. But uh, n none of them are as much fun to drive as like a 2,500 gallon water tanker, or as you would all call them tenders out there. But uh, for that very reason, you got 2,500 gallons of water trying to do its own thing behind you. And the laws of inertia are real. A great reminder for everyone to exercise extra caution when driving around or next to fire service vehicles, be sure to get out of the way. <laughs> Thank you to our listeners for tuning in. Thank you so much, Andrew, for joining us again. It's always a pleasure. If you have a question for the panel, please reach out to us at fireheadlines at wfca.com and let us know what's on your mind. We'll see you back here next week for more Fire Headlines.